Welcome back to the NATO Public Forum YouTube studio. I'm Jack Kelly from TLDR News, and I'm very happy to be joined by Shashank Joshi, the defense editor for The Economist. Thanks very much for having me. I'd like to start by discussing a prescient piece that you wrote in The Economist recently around Ukraine's interest in cluster munitions. What do you think that the arrival of these munitions will do to help Ukraine? And do you think that Ukraine needs more support from NATO when it comes to munitions more generally? Cluster munitions are controversial. There's, mm -hmm. there's no getting around that. They have been banned by well over 100 countries and they do pose a long-term risk to civilians. But on the other hand, it is worth stating that Ukraine is in serious need of ammunition to be able to conduct its offensive against Russia to liberate its own territory. It's also worth saying that these munitions would be very effective against the Russian forces who are dug into trenches and defensive positions that the Ukrainians are struggling to attack and cross. And it is also, on top of that, worth reminding people that cluster munitions are not a new weapon in this conflict. They've mm -hmm. been used by both Russia and Ukraine for over a year. They are already littering Ukrainian soil, so Ukraine's going to have to demine these areas. Mm -hmm. So the long and short of it is, I think these weapons can make a significant difference to Ukraine. I think they effectively take the pressure off its offensive and give it more time to conduct its its, its attacking uh, operations against Russia. But yes, Ukraine absolutely needs more support because there are just not many occasions in recent history where a country has tried to assault minefields and trenches and pillboxes and all these other things without air cover above it and without um, uh, dominance over the enemy. So we're seeing a pretty, a pretty uh, a forbidding, difficult operation here. Absolutely. And away from the battlefield, we're hearing reports of parallel peace negotiations between Lavrov and Richard Haas, the former president of the Council on Foreign Relations. What do you think the prospects for peace are more generally? And do you think that peace depends on the success of the ongoing counteroffensive? I would play down the importance of any of these meetings going on between experts, academics, mm -hmm. think tankers and, and Russian officials. These meetings happen a lot. They happen in the background. The, the discussions, I certainly wouldn't think they, they rise to the level Level of negotiations. I'm very pessimistic about the prospect of any serious talks. I think that uh, Ukraine still wants to take back significant amounts of its territory before it, it, it even considers the prospect of a serious diplomatic process. I think the Kremlin uh, sees no interest in diplomacy. It feels it has time on its side, which is a, a mistaken belief in my view, but, but that's what they think. Uh, and so I think we're going to see this war drag on into 2024 with very limited prospect of peace. But of course, a lot of this does hinge on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And if the Ukrainians can show the Russians that this is a losing proposition, that the longer they stay in this, the greater the risk of Russian forces unraveling and collapsing, of course, that makes a substantive difference to Ukraine's ability to come to negotiations with a strong hand. Apologies to quote you at yourself, but some of my colleagues are a big fan. Um, so I thought I'd reference an appearance you had on the Talking Politics podcast last year, during which you described the Bucharest Declaration when NATO said that Ukraine will become a member of NATO without promising a membership action plan as a botched compromise. How do you think NATO can better guarantee Ukraine's security this week? As a long-time interviewer, I've never conducted an interview as well prepared on a subject <laughs> as you have for this. I'll say that first. On the subject of... Ukraine and NATO membership, the Bucharest Declaration in, in 2008 made the mistake of saying that Ukraine would join the alliance, it will become a member, but it didn't say how and it didn't say when. And the vital thing that has to come out of the Vilnius summit is a credible signal that there is a pathway for Ukraine when the war is over, uh, that there is a tangible roadmap that gives them a sense of this not being something in the dim and distant future that might or might not happen, but that there are steps they can take that will see them in the alliance in a reasonable period of time. And in the absence of that, I think we have to remember we're going to have to prop up Ukraine's armed forces with huge amounts of support, huge amounts of cash. That's going to be much more expensive, much more uh, burdensome than giving them a mm -hmm. credible path into the alliance. You were just speaking on the main stage, you were moderating a discussion that was taking place a moment ago, during which you raised the issue of a NATO representative office in Tokyo, which is clearly a contentious issue among some member states. What do you make of this in particular, as well as NATO's newfound interest in the Indo-Pacific and how it could potentially put a strain on the alliance? The way I think about it is that 
NATO is interested in Asia primarily because Asia is more interested in NATO. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is China's rise as an economic, political, military actor means that it is imposing itself in the European Atlantic area, mm -hmm. whether that's in the cyber domain, whether that's through areas that don't pay as much heed to geography like space, what China's doing in space. Uh, China's growing nuclear arsenal uh, can increasingly reach new, uh, European states. So this isn't a case of NATO chasing dragons in Asia. This is a case of China affecting Europe European security. Now, there are debates among allies over how far NATO should respond to that. And mm -hmm. Clearly, the issue of a liaison office or a political office in Tokyo is somewhere where we, we don't see consensus. Mm -hmm. But I think there is consensus on the idea that partnerships with Japan, Australia, South Korea, countries that see China day to day mm -hmm. are going to be vital. And if I can give just one example of this and the way these things are connected in ways people don't always realize, let's look at the Ukrainian offensive and the degree to which it relies on a guaranteed sustainable supply line of shells. Who's providing those shells? Well, a lot of them are being provided by South Korea. Without South Korea, this offensive doesn't happen in the same way. And I think that's just a great example of the way in which stuff we think of as happening over there in Asia is actually directly affecting the European theatre as well. And finally, before the war in Ukraine really started, there was an apparent consensus among the West that future wars would be dominated by high precision technical strikes instead of mass troop manoeuvres. In fact, Boris Johnson told the Defence Select Committee in 2021 that the old concept of fighting big tank battles on European land are over. However, in your recent Leader for the Economist, you make the argument that the war in Ukraine has proved that while precision does still matter, it's not a sufficient substitute for mass. With this in mind, do you think that Western militaries are investing in the right new things in their military budgets? And are they striking the right balance between precision and mass? What we're seeing from Ukraine is that precision warfare is absolutely vital, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take away the fact that you need lots of stuff and lots of people. Ukraine is losing 10,000 drones per month. Yeah. Uh, how many European armies could sustain that rate mm -hmm. of loss? I would suggest none. Yeah. Uh, look at the number of shells Ukraine is firing. It may be firing them fantastically precisely mm -hmm. thanks to drones and artificial intelligence and the digital networks that connect the two, but it's still firing thousands upon thousands of shells per day. Mm -hmm. European armies would struggle to maintain that level of shell fire. And in the same way, they would struggle to take the losses that Ukraine has and still be in the fight. So I think what I take from watching Ukraine and its, its, its heroics on the battlefield is that you need the technology, you need the software, and it's vital. But you still need to have enough shells, enough munitions, uh, enough people to fire them, operate them, uh, to take casualties, to stay in the fight. And I think European armies have years to go before they're in a place where they're going to be ready for that kind of thing. Thank you so much for your time. Very Thanks. useful insight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.